I think it was Steven actually that said this, that they used to get it right with the comics, even in the X-Men. Yeah. That's actually because Feige was producing those movies as well. So like he was there with Fox and like he's such a comic book sweaty and he gets it. Like I just don't see that guy not doing the X-Men. You know what I mean? So I hope you're right. The, the, the other factor hmm. in there too, of course, and, and this is where a lot of things that we've observed seem to change is when Feige and I think Victoria Alonso had a lot to do with this as well. And I think you're totally right. She was definitely a problem. Um, but I don't think Feige was necessarily the end all be all savior. When they managed to run off Ike Perlmutter and get Disney to sidecar him. Yeah. And then eventually Disney, of course, as part of remember last year as part of the layoffs, they threw Ike Perlmutter out the door. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they they even removed it, him from the board, right? This is well, he wasn't yeah. on the Disney board. He was oh, okay. chairman of Marvel Entertainment, which was basically okay. nothing. Um they gave yeah. him a title because the man still held nearly four billion dollars worth of Disney stock. Makes sense, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So <laughs> when they here's the and everybody gave Perlmutter a bad rap. Oh, he was a sexist. He was a racist. He didn't want to do this and that. It's like Perlmutter he was, was the guy. That was just it. Perlmutter was the guy that was like why are we spending two hundred and fifty million dollars to make this? And this was ten years ago. This is when two fifty was like, yeah. insane. Remember what happened with the first Guardians movie? The first Guardians of the Galaxy movie that came out in twenty sixteen, the stated budget you can go look on the numbers right now still says one hundred and seventy million. Hmm. Did you see what they actually spent? Mm -mm. Two fifty. Okay. They, they went a little over budget. Yeah, well, it was saying, just that one movie, though. So thankfully, it was just yeah. that one movie, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So yeah. I mean, it's like oh, I have a qu question. Yeah. That's where Paul Mutter was like getting. It. But his point yeah. was, we've got to keep putting. We need if we're going to spend that kind of money, we have to keep giving them the characters they know and they want. Yeah. And he was pushing against the Alonzos, and I think the Feige's to a large extent. They're like, well, we want to bring in Captain Marvel. We want to bring in. Uh, we want to bring in all these other Disney-made characters that since Marvel has brought it out, or since Marvel bought out, excuse me, Disney bought out Marvel, pardon me, yeah. and made things like Riri Williams and all this other kind of stuff. And that's when that's when he was kind of like, we can't, that's, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. And then, oh, he was a racist. He was a sexist and all this. And people turned around and said, see, Ike Perlmutter was wrong. Because Captain Marvel did a billion dollars. And it's like, sure. yeah. you could have put two hours of footage of a dead blind monkey on yeah. screen right before Endgame, and it would have made a billion dollars. I agree with that, but I'm sorry. would you not say that that's brilliant programming? Because, like, yeah. to me... I love dead monkeys. To be able <laughs> to do that... For that. <laughs> like, like, seriously, though, because like, I, I get it, and I'm with you on this, but here's the thing. It's dead, and it's like, blind. <laughs> I'm sorry. He makes, I killed Pro. I'm sorry. Can you make a wish no, on the good. Like, no, no, but you were, I agree well, with you, but like the thing is, that's programming. Like, the thing right. that we're not saying with that statement is people cared so much about the overall Marvel story and that's what Marvel it. had built that they were willing to watch Captain Marvel, right? And you know, the blind monkeys, so that they could <laughs> like have a just a little bit more of that lore. So, like, I, I totally agree with you. And I think one of the things that's interesting about Feige, and this is one of the things I can't oh, quite nice. figure out for myself. Mm -hmm. is like well what is this guy the actual one that is making these decisions that again i think are are literally screwing up representation or is he just susceptible to the culture and is he susceptible to people like victoria alonso because like mm -hmm. as for instance um I think it's a fair question. Came to uh the eternals right a lot of the things that i've heard from behind the scenes is that Feige and uh, Zhao fought a lot on that mm -hmm. movie. Mm -hmm. He ended up um, just letting her win. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, I've heard she's not coming back from the next one. Right. So that's Which I a still little can't bit even of... believe that was even on the table to make another one yeah. of those damn it's things. It's weird. It's weird. But that to me is what has me questioning like, what, what, what are they thinking? Yeah. Like, well, and that's the kind of thing that to me, like, there was, if Ike Perlmutter were still sitting there and had, had co authority, with Feige yeah. like he used to up until, uh, you know, 2016, 2017. Yeah. Um, there was, there'd be no way that, like, they wouldn't have made the first Eternal movies and there was there would be no talk of Eternals too. It's like, y'all Sure, nuts? sure. But here's, <laughs> here's what I'm saying. Here's, like, my point, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I feel like Feige, like, knew his way was better. Mm -hmm. And he allowed a lesser product to come out 
because he didn't want the perception of white man telling woman of color how to direct her movie, which by all accounts was exactly how he ran the infinity saga up till end game. He was like, pu- he was like hand up their ass puppeteering these people. Right. Mm-hmm. There used to be jokes about how, when you went to go direct a Marvel movie, you were at summer camp because essentially yeah. they had the action scenes already done. There was actually a different unit that would shoot that. You weren't even going to shoot that. Yep. Um, the script was not even finished, but they had ideas. Right. And so like he had this ironclad control. And then in phase four, it seems like he, because of the culture and the perception, like again with She Hulk, like I think about this all the time because, um, you know, like there were some really weird interviews that came out where I forget the lady that did uh, the She Hulk show, but she was talking about how the only note that Feige had on the finale was he didn't think the robot should have had a hat on. It. Oh, yeah, the, oh, the Feige hat so on. The- and I'm like, I'm like, look, look, I've been following this dude for like 15 years, maybe 20 mm-hmm. years. That is there's no way that's his only note. But maybe that is what he said, because, mm-hmm. again, I think to him, the perception is like, um, if I do this, if I get in here and tinker, the narratives that could run from that could be very damaging for the brand. I think that's a mistake, by the way. I think that he yeah. messed up by doing that. But that's I'm just saying point. that, like, I think that it's a uh, like I've heard other people talk about this, too, where you got to understand that it's easy for people like us to like say some outlandish shit or like point out the obvious like hypocrisy of some of this woke stuff or whatever. It's easy for us. If you're in the game, if you're in Hollywood, Mm -hmm. I don't think it's easy for you. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's a lot of pressure, supposed pressure from outside forces, but a lot of pressure internally as well to like make those decisions because of that, which I think is wrong. And I think you should make decisions based on merit. But -hmm. all I'm trying to say is that, I think it's actually understandable, especially because a lot of the stuff was produced, what, like two, three years ago? Mm -hmm. Think about that time and how crazy things were politically. I actually don't necessarily blame them for making those decisions. And I hope and I would hope that there's a way for like the fandom to like push back and basically be like, nah, dude, like that's bullshit. Like you can't do that. Like you can't just do it for the optics, right? Uh, and what I've heard from behind the scenes is like, yeah, that is an idea that's permeated, possibly why uh, Victoria was let go. Because Feige knew that she was going to get let go. And the way I heard it was he would normally have stepped in. Mm-hmm. If there was if there if he wanted to protect her, he could have stepped in and protected her. And he didn't. Um, so, yeah, for what I it's worth, that's kind of my an take. option at that point, because somebody had to fall on the sword. Right. Yeah. And Victoria Alonzo was for a very long time she was the uh i can't remember the exact title but you know president in charge of post-production in vfx yeah well we all know the disaster stories that we've heard in the last several years about the complete mismanagement particularly on the post-production side uh <clears throat> of things to where they were going back they were ordering reshoots they were they were working vfx artists double triple overtime Marvel was the most hated and despised name in the industry by post-production VFX workers and all these third-party houses that they would hire to come in and do this because they were so disorganized, they were such a mess, and Victoria Alonso's name was the cuss word on everybody's tongue in those those offices. So somebody had to fall on the sword, and I'm sure Kevin at one point was like, (laughs) damn sure ain't gonna be me. (laughs) So even though he was the head honcho, but it's like somebody's got to go, and it's going to be her. Yeah, uh, and and it's like she was an easy one to just throw on there because I think they even changed her title at one point to president of physical production and post production. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, nobody yeah. else in Hollywood had that title. Nobody else would have both. But it's like they threw her in that hot seat with the deliberate intent of <clears throat> you're done. And we mm-hmm. it was a setup for now again she was already a mess, and then Disney just had to sit there and wait for the proper impetus to throw her out the door. And what did they say? They didn't say that she was a horrible person in the office that was a terrible mismanager of billions of dollars worth of assets, destroyed the budgets of countless Marvel films. Yeah. Basically, this woman didn't know what she was doing. They couldn't say that, right, which would have been the truth. Mm. They went with, well, she violated her contract by working with, what was it, Amazon or Netflix on some pet project. Amazon. Mm-hmm. Amazon. Yeah. 
and she wound up doing promotion for it by walking down the red carpet at some show instead of with Disney. I guess it was the Oscars. That was, uh, by the way, that was the self-documentary that was intended to kind of create separation between her and her dictatorial lineage back in Argentina. So she's, right. uh, she's got a colorful <laughs> background. <clears throat> yes, quite. I, I didn't know that. I, I do have one thing to add. This is going back to so the, anyway, to that, the That's what Disney used to fire her was the fact that it was a breach of contract by promoting another project okay. with another studio. So, yeah. 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 Uh, could, Disney, the whole uh, X-Men thing, do you think that I think that the cartoon that could probably going to come out first, right? Yeah. That's going to be our clear signs of where they're going with X-Men. Because we've seen that when the show was first announced and how some of the producers behind it were putting their values of polit political, trying to make yeah. it for this day and age, I got worried. And I've seen we've seen some of the cell animations and some of the character designs. They're not too off, but they're not too right. But yeah, that's for sure. Me. That's the stepping stone. And that's where we're going to learn. That's what's happening with every show. Excuse me. <clears throat> we're seeing this same method with every show. They're testing the waters to see how much they're getting right, how much they're getting wrong. And then when they realize it goes wrong, we're still to blame, but they're getting slowly, I guess, better, or they're just trying to make it mediocre through. I don't even know what the good product is anymore. Yeah. yeah it's it's nonsense. Well, yeah. X-Men, it's kind of interesting because I think as far as the show, obviously can't speak to it, right? I've heard mixed things, but I will say that X-Men in general seems to be a brand that not only Marvel Studios, but Marvel Comics mm -hmm. is like doubling and tripling down on because like Marvel Comics is in a really bad spot too. Oh, and they yeah. just put Tom Brevoort, who was traditionally like the Avengers uh, editor on X books, which was like a sign of like, oh, they're they're going hard on X books. So I would expect with Marvel Studios and with Marvel Comics for X-Men and that brand to be pushed uh, a lot um, as far as the show itself. And like the, uh, you know, you know, the producers, I actually used to follow that guy. I think his name is like Bo or whatever. So this yeah. is what's weird about that. It's like everybody remembers him saying that he was putting his experiences of being a, a gay black man into the show. But when no, that's nobody... not what I was sorry. Okay. Sorry. No, it was all his whole Trump dissertation or something like that. I think it was. Oh, so I'm not, yeah, yeah, I'm not familiar so with I, that. Yeah. So pretty much it, it has nothing to do with that. It's just there's, that was the article I read. And then the, that doesn't really bother me, but it's like, why are you voicing this right after the announcement? Why is it the mm. constant thing going, here's my love of the property. Here's why I'm attached to it. And not sure. focusing on any of those things. They always seem to have the same repetitive thing. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but we're seeing a constant history of Twitter yeah. outbursts and media outbursts where the, the company must be going, who didn't put the muzzle on the actor or oh, I agree. the producer at the time. And it's, that's the stuff I follow. And it, I, it totally, makes, I totally, I totally get too. that. Yeah, no, I totally get that. And I agree with you. I think PR, this is a PR thing to me. Yeah, and it's like, PR. you know, Disney's PR has been trash for the last three years. But this Bo guy used to work on The Witcher. And he yeah. left The Witcher because he said the people were disrespecting the source material. Awesome. He literally said, I didn't bring anybody on to the X-Men unless they were a fan of the original series. He's on record oh, saying man. stuff like that. So it's like, I get it, man. And like, dude. Trust Protected me, I, I hear these people say some stuff and I'm just like, yo, shut up. You know what I mean? Because I'm at the end of the day, I'm at, in some ways like I feel like I have to sort of try to carry the torch for this shit. And I'm like, you're making my job really difficult. But I do think and I think it's fair to bring up that it tends to be a focus factor because this dude yeah, literally said, like yeah, because he literally said like, like we all get that why Henry Cavill walked away from The Witcher. We yeah. all respect that choice. We all understand that. Like, yes, it should be fans. He said that, too. But it's just the lensing of modern media tends to focus on the stuff that's a little bit more uh, controversial, if that yeah. makes sense. I would like to add, though, like, even though I, I state these things, it doesn't mean I automatically am antagonistic or hateful towards the individual. <laughs> I mark the actions versus the, the, the person itself, right? Because the actions do build the persona. And if it's whether it's your social media manager or not, yeah, the responsibility falls on why are you doing stuff like this or why are you just showing that? So. I don't hate right. this person because of those comments. I'm just saying I'll still yeah. look at the cells. I'll still look at the scenes. I still watch every show except for Andor to make my own criticism. Because then if I don't, my criticism is invalid no matter what because I'm going off assumption. And I'm not that yeah. type of persona with that. I think a lot of people need to focus on the pros and cons. Josh, yeah. let me ask you a question about Feige real quick. I know uh, yep. we've got to get to these super Sorry chats. But one of the things yep. that I have always thought about Feige is that he has ambitions that are even higher than Marvel. And that's kind of what I think happened with Phase 4 and Phase 5, is I think that he was test piloting the idea of what would happen if he went higher up in the Disney company, which I yeah. think that's really his passion. I, I think that he loves the Disney company, the Disney brand. 
And I think that he would like to be higher up and sort of filling in uh, what Lassiter was for a little bit. Now, there was some pushback because for a while we were thinking that John Favreau might do that as well. But I think that Feige, uh, because of his ambitions, it makes him perhaps over the only division that would course correct inside Disney, or one of the only, because yeah. his persona and his legacy is precious to him, and he is not he is not joyful to fail whatsoever. And yeah. regardless of what the social push might be of the time, in Kevin Feige's mind, Feige comes first. What do you make of that? Yeah, no, I'd agree. I think, um, like, you know, I keep going back to this Victoria Alonso thing, and it's just like very, like, we don't know the full truth of it, right? But I, there were rumors that he and there was the big three. So it was like him, Nate Moore, Luis D'Esposito, and um, Victoria. So apparently they'd been beefing for years. And, and I don't know to what extent, but I think you're right in the sense that Feige is certainly looking out for Feige first. And a lot of people don't talk about this. But he's absolutely cutthroat behind the scenes. And that's that probably feels weird to say, but trust me, like I've heard stories. There's examples of you just look at the programming, like uh they announced Batman v Superman, he does Civil War and comes out first and literally crushes them. And like just the way that he like he he sort of you know talks like he's Mr. Rogers, but behind the scenes, he's very competitive and very cutthroat. So yeah. I think you're right in the sense that yeah, he's absolutely looking out for himself, which I think we're kind of in agreement is is like going to end up being a good quality because he's not going to allow this sort of rubbish to kind of like drag him down. And so like, yes, I do see a scenario of turning this around because of that. But I don't know that that I don't know if I would agree that he was so focused on um, being John Lasseter or Alan Horn or whomever. I think he was actually potentially looking at branching into Star Wars and Secret Wars was his whole thing. So I think immediately after Endgame, he starts planning Secret Wars, which, by the way, was supposed to come out in 2024. Before the pandemic, mm -hmm. he was going to do Secret Wars in 2024. So he was going to turn around and bring Hugh Jackman, Tobey Maguire, all these cats back and do like one last like big hoorah Bring through the portal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I that was his mentality. I absolutely agree that he delegated. And he delegated way too much. And that's like the problem that we're in is like he just he delegated too much while focusing on Star Wars and Secret Wars. Because, again, like if you think about the Marvel process and, you know, I've been following this stuff intimately for like a long time. The idea that Marvel writes scripts is just crazy. They don't. They have ideas and they work them together. Iron Man 1 didn't even have a completed script when they went to shoot it. So they are always scrambling. And that's always been their way. That's the been difference a problem was, for them, yeah. Well, it's been a problem. But it's also been a formula for success because they, they did that all throughout the Infinity Saga. The difference is the scale was so much smaller back then that he was able to literally puppeteer every one of these movies. And something changed where he did delegate. And uh, I think to a large degree, the delegations were a major problem. I mean, there's so many of these that don't feel like the Marvel projects that we had in the Infinity Saga, right? So, I mean, you know, it's weird because I'm also at a place where, like, I think he still owns that. I don't think he gets off the hook because that's ultimately his decision.